Welcome to the um, American Southern Neurosurgeons Introductory Curriculum for Fellows. This uh, program was designed by Dr. Masoka Gupta, Levine, and myself as an edward review of the uh, fundamentals of Southern Elbow Surgery. And uh, we really hope that everyone listening will learn and enjoy. The uh, topic tonight is elbow trauma. And uh, our moderator is Dr. Scott Steinman, a very good friend of mine. Um, Dr. Steinman is the chair of the ASCS Fellowship Committee. And he's very experienced in shoulder surgery, but also in elbow surgery and particularly elbow trauma. Joining uh, him tonight, I'd like to introduce Dr. Emily Cheng, who uh, trained with us at Mayo and uh, is now the uh, head of shoulder elbow surgery at the Stanford. And uh, Dr. Brad Parsons uh, from Mount Sinai. As uh, you all know, we love the interaction, so please use the chat window to ask any questions you may have, and we will be looking at the chat window and then asking questions uh, to uh, doctors. Steinman, um, Cheng, and uh, Parsons. So Scott, if you're ready, you can uh, go ahead anytime, and uh, we're looking forward to the program. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Joaquin. I want to thank uh, Bill Levine, uh, yourself, uh, Ron, John, uh, Gus, uh, for helping put this uh, together, and we're very lucky. I get the easy job tonight. I get to just show cases, but uh, uh, Brad uh, and Emily uh, can help us work through this, and We'll just go through as many cases as we can. Uh, the common thing tonight is trauma, elbow trauma. We got some easy cases and maybe some more complex cases, but those are some of the cases that you'll be seeing, hopefully, uh, in, in your fellowship year uh, during your shoulder and elbow fellowship. So uh, we'll start off. Uh, see if we can get the cases going here. So the uh, first case, um, this is a 64-year-old male um, motorcyclist. So this was a, a loss of consciousness. This is a high velocity trauma and wore his helmet so he survived and had this uh, fracture dislocation of his uh, elbow. You can see uh, some of the pictures there, x-rays, um, Emily and, and Brad. It was reduced. You can see a nice reduction in the, in the ER, maybe not the best uh, splint. And then we got some um, CAT scans looking, uh, looking at the elements here. And I'll just kind of walk you through here a little bit. We can see that the majority of the sublime tubercle of the coronoid is intact. And kind of look at the view, probably the view on the right probably says it best. It's, it's always hard to determine the, the direction of instability that occurred, but this looks like a more of a, a pure axial trauma where it shears off the more lateral or the very uh, anterior part of the uh, coronoid and same to the, um, to the radial head. Uh, and so uh, thoughts, Emily? Emily, maybe we'll start, start with your thoughts on, um, on this patient with that, uh, dislocation again. Obviously, we might say, looking at these injury films, what ligaments are intact and probably not medial or, or lateral, but uh, Maybe walk us through your thoughts, Emily, on, on how you might uh, approach approach this patient. Right. So it looks like um, looks like the radial head is comminuted there. Um, looks like there are some fragments um, that uh, may be emanating from the distal humerus that got cut off on the 3D CT scan. But um, I'm thinking that uh, this patient's going to have a high chance of instability or recurrent instability. And um, and I so I'd start with um, you mean surgically. So I'd probably start on the on the lateral side. Uh, we we assess the uh, integrity of the radial head, and it looks like it's pretty comminuted. So we would uh, potentially you know have a radial head replacement available. Uh, but try and fix that, and um, definitely want to you know through that lateral approach look at the uh, lateral collateral ligament and um, and uh, whether or not we fix that, of course, I probably try our very best to fix it um, at, at the beginning on the, mm -hmm. I mean, on the lateral side. And then I'd assess the stability after that. And um, if it was still unstable in the OR, then I'd consider opening up the medial side. And that's exactly the approach uh, we had, uh, Emily. Um, so, 
We did a rate of home replacement, like as she suggested. He's 64 years old. He's, he's not 24 years old. Still rides a motorcycle. Um, we did not do fixation of the coronary. It's just that we, we assessed that uh, evaluation under anesthesia. The majority of the sublime tubercle was intact, so we had his medial runner intact, in so to speak. And we did soft, soft tissue repair of the, of the lateral side, as, as you alluded to, due to the trauma, it was quite significant. And it was splintered for a couple of weeks. So you can see here, we opened up the skin and essentially the whole lateral side fell apart. We can see the bald, as we often see the bald lateral epicondyle. And we replaced that, you can see the bottom, bottom slide. And then sort of put that back by, by a suture technique and did not approach the medial side, uh, which we assessed through that. And uh, there's post-op, you can see the anchor holes and uh, did okay. I wouldn't say did great. Uh, you can see the range of motion at over a year and a half, uh, 25 to 130, and supination and pronation a little bit limited, but a happy camper, and uh, he went on to it back onto his motorcycle. He didn't really learn much uh, from that. So let's go into uh, the next case. Uh, can I yeah, go ahead, Brad. You know, I think for, for the fellows involved, you know, when you get out to practice, these cases can run from uh, simple to complex, as Scott sort of alluding to, and so, you know, Emily and Scott both had the plan of a possible radial head replacement. You know, these patients may require some sort of static fixation. So whether it's an internal joint stabilizer or an X fix, especially if it's a big person with a big heavy arm and the coronoid is fragmented, even the, the anterior aspect of it, the tip, as Scott said, the sublime tubercle is okay. But if there's more of a grade two anterior fragment, you can see that looks like the coronoid uh, on that middle upper right picture, right, Scott? That's what. Right, exactly. So you can see the tips of bolst. And so, you know, you have to be cautious because I've gotten fooled with these where it seems like it's stable and then the, the only humeral joint sags open and the, and the humerus rides into the coronary. And so, especially in a big, heavy arm, I've been more aggressive about fixating these for a period of time. And so I would just tell the fellows, you're never going to be sad that you had an external fixator or an inter inter internal joint stabilizer in the room to help you if these cases don't go as easily as Scott and Emily are making them uh, appear because they're such technically gifted surgeons. And, and that's such a great point, Brad, because that's sort of the theme tonight. I'm going to show very similar cases and uh, we'll talk about X-Fix uh, a little bit and uh, even non offer treatment, but that, that's a very Assessing the, the stability of, of the elbow, I think even before you make the incision, we'll talk a little bit about EUA in a little bit. So here's a little bit of an un unusual case. Um, this is a, a, a com oh. competitor in a weightlifting uh, competition that, because they're taking pictures, they caught the exact moment and his coach was in the front row. He wasn't the one taking the picture, but he hurt his elbow. He heard it explode and yeah. collapse. And that's the moment when it happened. And there he is lying on the ground. And I don't know if you can see my pointer, but that's, that's almost an open dislocation that's into the humerus over here. Interesting enough, most open elbow dislocations occur with the humerus coming out medially. And it's, it's not, maybe not uncommon in weightlifting competitions here. At the Olympics, notice this guy's lifting more weight than, than my guy, but he's at the Olympics, of course. But I don't know if you can see my pointer, but he's, he's trying to point out with his thumb that uh, his olecranon's over here, but his humerus is coming out the medial, almost coming out the medial side of his, uh, of, his, of his elbow. So these are high stress injuries. So this is what my guy looked like. Um, he did, it's hard to see, but he did have a teeny tiny coronoid fracture, but uh, otherwise when he was reduced, he literally couldn't stay in. Uh, and it was easy for the, for the fellow or the residents to diagnose, well, oh, Dr. Steinman, everything seems to be torn, LCL, MCL, <laughs> Rick Alice keeps falling out. I said, what's not torn? Uh, the biceps. And we'll get back to it. Hopefully you have time for a biceps case uh, or a non-biceps case, so to speak, later on. So what, what, should, what should we do? He, he uh, once returned to competition. And I remember he's actually a smart guy, which is kind of an oxymoron, a smart, you know, heavyweight lift lifter or whatever. But anyway, he was <laughs> a smart guy. And he says, I need to lock out. I need to fully extend, oh, fully extend to return to competition. I can't even have a five degree flexion contraction. And I said, okay. But uh, so just, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of show Brad what, what we did, but maybe your, your thoughts on how you approach someone that 
uh, won't even stay in at, uh, at 40 to 60 degrees of, of flexion. It keeps kind of falling out. Yeah, I mean, I, I, when it's this bad, uh, even when you reduce them and you try your different rotational motions to the forearm, when both ligaments are out, the idea of pronating or supinating and keeping the elbow in 90 degrees of flexion, at least probably in my experience, won't work. And so uh, this ends up being an operative case for me. Um, if you're lucky and you can get it stable and concentric and you can put them in uh, a splinter or cast and keep them there, then that's reasonable because it's, it's a soft tissue injury without a significant bony involvement. But when it's grossly unstable like this, and as you said, you extend them to 40 or 60 and they're coming out again, it's an operative indication. So, you know, for these, I think, again, you can start laterally, but obviously it's a pure valgus load. It looked like from your picture that resulted in this elbow dislocating purely laterally like this, the forearm laterally to the humerus. So and you're going to have to deal with, I think, both collateral ligaments. Um, and so you can start laterally, but in my opinion, this is probably something where I would do a medial lateral window. I don't tend to like a posterior excision, incision to do both sides. It just has not worked well in my hands, but I'd be prepared to repair or reconstruct both sides. Yeah, that's exactly what we did. So uh, I'm just kind of take, I have a little video. So this is a video actually not of him. I'd be clear, it's not him, but a very similar image. This is a woman had her arm out the window of the car and almost had it taken off. She had an open injury on the medial side, but we did a, an anchor, a heavy anchor, and then a suture um, bridge technique that I initially was called an internal X fix. You can see the suture yep. from an anchor in the humerus, well, up a condyle, and we kind of stitched everything back together. So we did that. And I got him moving day, day two, and we did his medial side the same way. So it was four anchor repair, medial repair with the heavy suture and the lateral the same. And then when he came back in five weeks, I was very happy. He was still in. He had full extension. I was, he was super happy. And I said, now we can have you start lifting maybe five to 10 pounds. <laughs> he started laughing. I said, why are you laughing? He says, can I share something on my cell phone? And I said, sure. And I'm watching this. Luckily, I already examined him. He was in, he had full range of motion. I said, what? He says, I did this yesterday, Dr. Steinman. I'm like, okay. Okay, I think we can go up from five to 10 pounds to maybe 20 to 30 pounds, um, but whatever. So, so maybe he wasn't as smart as I, as I thought he was, but um, he certainly uh, was happy and got his full range of motion and strength back. I, I probably couldn't lift the bar now, probably. But anyway, so here he is at a year. And you can see the HO that he had there, but he had full range of motion. He was very happy. And he actually uh, was part owner in a gym. So he really kind of needed to have full range of motion to get back, back to work. So I, so I think Brad brings that excellent point that this is one also that potentially you could use an X fix on or some sort of X fix or internal joint stabilizer, but he may not give full extension if, if he did that. that. That would be uh, debatable. But then we can move on to the the next case that I thought it was interesting but and this is one just just for the fellows and I can ask you guys which what you guys have done but um, this is actually a slide from David Ring and we're talking about treatment of the unstable elbow have you guys done this technique of putting pins uh, kind of the whole things together it's it seems to work but you better make sure they come out the back of the humerus because those, those pins will tend to break I think uh, and you can pull them out if they're coming out the back of the humerus any experience you guys have on no, I, I, I've not. I've not statically fixated the elbow with a transarticular fixation. I've either done an X fix and statically locked it, or a dynamic stabilizer. How about you, Emily? Yeah, I've I've never um, placed those, uh, you know, static external pins that cross the joints. So, um, but I know that, it, you know, that is becoming you know, one of those things that people do and we see in our clinic, of course. Um, but my concern is um, for using them is, of course, the infection risk if we have to operate on them. Yep. Yeah, I've never done, done it myself, but uh, if you're on a desert island, it's something you can do to hold it back and forth. <laughs> better, than, better than leaving it out. So, um, and just, to, just for the fellows, uh, I think all of us appreciate the value of an evaluation under anesthesia. When you get the patient in the OR before you make the incision, just to kind of double check and see if he has the medial side totally blown out. Wow, it really opens up. And as Yogi Berra said, you can observe a lot just by watching. So that's, uh, I believe that for most, uh, most elbow trauma cases, the first thing I do is do an EOA under chloro. 
Scott, I mean, I think that's a point that really should be, you know, in, reinforced because at least when I was training and came into practice, you know, the dogma at that point, we were, you know, sort of, there was this algorithm that, that we had learned to approach the terrible triad and the elbow, the unstable elbow, start laterally, treat the coronoid, and the MCL was the last thing we worried about. And you pretty much had to find a reason to do something to the MCL. And we now know, I think, that it's more often injured than we would think with, with uh, tra trauma of the elbow. And this, is, this case is perfect. If you don't fix that medial side, He's not going to do well. He's going to open up and he's not going to get his motion. And he's going to have some mild subluxation, which is going to affect his, not only his motion, but his outcome. And so you have to make the elbow stable, whether that means fixing the medial side. He's got his secondary restraints with his, with his radial head, but you've got to, I think, fix the medial side in such a severe soft tissue injury. And one thing I, I'll point out when I've done a few other cases like that, these gross instabilities, using this heavy suture technique of an internal bridge, so to speak, you can over tighten one side and then I've gone to the, whatever side to do next yep. and I can't reduce it because I pulled them too far in them too tight lateral or too far, too tight medially. It's easier to make them too tight laterally because you can actually have the radial head uh, sublux, so to speak, a little bit anterior. So you have to be careful. You can make them too tight with this technique. Right. Well, here's a, here's a, a 61 year old female who fell and maybe Somewhat similar to that motorcycle guy, uh, but this is uh, maybe a heavier forearm, and I think I have a case with an even heavier forearm. So we can see here that this lateral view, um, there's clearly a dislocation, maybe a little subtle, but a dislocation, fracture dislocation in the 61-year-old. Uh, it's reduced, uh, and of course, I think almost every patient I think about surgery I think all of us are getting uh, CT scans and I always like to get this, the 3D views as you can see here. And also I think the subtraction views I think are so, so helpful. So here we see a um, somewhat large coronoid fracture, not terribly displaced there and a radial head fracture. And she wasn't the healthiest of, of people. Um, and you can see here I'm doing an EOA and you can see some spot views. So she opens up medially and she opens up laterally, which should not be surprising since she had a dislocation, which would tend to tear both medial and lateral sides. And um, Emily, uh, thoughts on, on how to approach this, not the healthiest lady, but uh, uh, clearly yeah. coronoid fracture and, and radial, head, radial neck fracture, I guess. So. Yeah, so, um, you know, similarly, I would start, you know, Similarly, I'd start on the lateral side. Um, if uh, the radial head wasn't uh, uh, fixable, then uh, we'd do a radial head replacement and uh, fix the lateral ligaments. And then on this one, I'd actually make a uh, medial incision um, if, if I didn't take the radial head, you know, if we took the radial head off, then we could potentially approach it through a lateral incision. So I should back up a little bit. Um, but assuming the radial head was reconstructable, um, I would approach this coronoid fracture through a medial incision. And similar to Brad, I like to make medial and lateral incisions rather than a straight posterior incision. Um, because of seroma formation and the, you know, the need to make really big skin flaps um, to get access to both sides. So I, uh, so then medially, I would probably think that that, um, that fragment would be reducible um, with two um, re cannulated screws coming from the dorsal surface of the ulna and, and extending upwards. Um, you know, I usually, I, my experience with plates along the coronoid is they don't contour very well, especially when it's so far medial there. I mean, that looks like it's about 50% of the height of the coronoid surface there, so. And yeah, those, uh, those are all the, all the, exactly the same thoughts uh, we had, uh, exactly. And the EUA under, under anesthesia, and she was not the healthiest person, so I didn't want to make too long of an operation. I, I love fixing coronoid. Fractures. I helped develop a cor coronoid plate, uh, but um, just to kind of show that what you can get away with and how this is not a, uh, it's not a perfect science. It's, um, we don't always have the correct answer. So we talked about her, uh, her EUA. So um, 
all we did was re repair the lateral collateral ligament complex. I didn't fix the, uh, the coronoid fracture or the radial neck fracture at all. Uh, so it was a fairly quick, maybe half hour operation. But one thing that, that I've done, um, I think is part of the algorithm we should all uh, think about, is not just flexing someone and treating them non-operably at 90 degrees in a splint, but the more you flex the elbow up, it tightens up the triceps and helps hook on the radial head and the coronoid or, or what's left of it to get greater stability. So I'll often put someone in a, in a splint at 120 degrees and hold them there for two weeks, then bring them back down to 90. So I did that technique, very quick, op, relatively quick operation. And I was really um, planning on 120 degrees to help me out. And then we brought them down to 90 for, for another week. And uh, she did, uh, you know, it's almost embarrassing, but uh, five months, she, her <laughs> range of motion was zero to 150, supination in 80. I was like, geez, you know, when an orthopedic doctor or, or an orthopedic surgeon, uh, that limited uh, operation helped her out. So again, I don't have all the answers and you know, I was fully prepared to put my favorite medial plate on or the two screws and I'll show a case a little bit later on where, where the two screw technique we use. But um, just to show the fellows, you know, there are a lot of ways to skin a cat and you need to look at the health of the patient and sometimes less is more, but just to emphasize that if you hyperflex the, the elbow at 120 degrees for just a couple of weeks, about a couple of patients actually get claustrophobic in that position. So it, it, it's, it's not initially benign to their psyche, but it's a technique we, we can all use. So Scott, go back to that 3D CT, because I think there's a couple more, you know, I think you, you know this obviously because you treat so many of these, but you look at that radial head fracture, it's a little depressed, but it's a neck fracture and the radial head is relatively intact, right? So there's a secondary buttress potentially to the medial side. The coronoid fracture is one big fragment and although it's rotated, it's at the relative preservation of its height. So it's a little bit displaced distally and rotated on the radial side. But again, you have relatively good position of those fragments. And you know, especially when you treat comminuted coronoid fragments where you've got three or four pieces, you're hoping to just get some of that buttress back and accept a little bit of malposition as long as it doesn't allow for pure distal or anterior subluxation and humerus relative to the ulna. And so this fracture morphology, I think, allowed you to do that. And the point I'm trying to make is for the residents fellows, just because it's a radial neck fracture, like Emily said, she's going to approach it laterally. Don't sacrifice the radial head to get to the coronary because now you've opened Pandora's box a little bit. So if you feel like the coronary has to be fixed and the radial head's pretty good, Go to the medial side and deal with it and, and don't disrupt the radial head. I'm sure you're going to show some poster medial disability cases. But, you, know, you want to make sure that you're not making more damage than, than fixing. Scott, a question came uh, through the chat from one of our fellows, Dr. Sweeney. So uh, how did you decide uh, not to do anything for the radial head and the coronoid? Was it based on just a CT scan or an AUE? He's, he's wondering. It, it, was, um, it was both the EUA uh, she was not grossly unstable and her health. Uh, she was not the healthiest lady. And I, one thing I, I hear people say, and I'm not a big practitioner of that, is like, fix it and then examine them. Because my fixation techniques are not that great. I, you know, if I put a plate on a coronary, I'm not going to stress it again. Right. So I kind of want to make the decisions at the initial EUA. And then for the most part, I stick with that plan. I would say in this case, when I did the lateral repair, I gently ranged her by flexion extension, but not varus valgus, just flexion extension. And she was stable enough, but not enough that I was going to put her at 90 degrees. That's why I put her up at 120 degrees for two weeks because I was concerned. I didn't fix the coronary. So Scott, did you counsel the patient ahead of time that they might be in that position? Because that, you know, it's kind of like when we're doing posterior instability in the shoulder and we put them in an external rotation brace and they're like, well, you didn't tell me you were doing this and I got to walk around with this thing now. So how do you counsel the patient? They're going to be stuck like this for two weeks. I, I always tell them that. I, I say, you know, we're going to fix what we need to fix. And you'll probably be, this is every time I do a distal humerus fracture and I move the nerve or do something to the ulnar nerve, I say, you're going to wake up and your small finger is going to be totally numb. I remember one patient woke up and said, hey, my small finger is totally numb, just like you said. I'm like, is it really? <laughs> um, but I always 
you know, I, I, I tell them that. I think it's an important thing for the fellows to, to tell them, also for distal humerus fractures and all the nerve issues. So I know I didn't treat this patient non-operatively, but just we should know that non-operative treatment of terrible triad, you could maybe call it trifle triad, uh, is something to consider. So just because it, it, it meets the criteria of a terrible triad in this a small series from David Ring doesn't mean you have to fix them all. Also, Graham King also uh, showed 12 patients, obviously not a lot because a lot of these we fix, but I think you should have it in your armamentarium if, uh, if it's an unhealthy patient um, or you're like, well, that's not too displaced. I think your EUA will help you guide, or in the clinic, a, a general EUA will help guide you this. And also the technique of, if you have a coronoid fracture, and I'll try and show in the video, if you, if you have your arm out of the patient like this and have them do their own valgus, and Graham King talks a lot about that. If, if there's a grinding that's going on, and you feel grinding as you, as you range them uh, from a gravity stress uh, of, of varus, those patients probably need to be fixed. But um, again, that's, we're still sorting that out. So another 61-year-old, okay, terrible triad. And this, uh, getting back to what Emily and Brad were saying, this is a lady with a big forearm. Mm. So, um, and I think that's a good warning sign, male or female, if you have a big forearm and you got osteoporotic bone at your elbow, it can be a, a situation. So yeah. this patient uh, had a radial head replacement and just lateral ligament imbrication uh, by the lo local surgeon. And this is what they look like post-op. Now, you can see the view on the right shows subluxation, but the view on, for me, the view on the, on the left is more disconcerting. It's, it's truly, truly subluxed. So yeah. what do you do that? You don't just put the patient in a brace. <laughs> put in a brace. Personally, I, I hate these uh, hinge braces. They're expensive, and I, I tend to use a, just a plastic uh, uh, brace. But the patient got stuck in this brace for six weeks, and by the time it came to Rochester, um, she'd been this way for a while. So. CT scan, of course. Um, so we can see there's some comminution of that, of that coronoid uh, fracture. It's now maybe eight, seven weeks out now or something like that. Um, you can see the radial, radial head there. So um, Brad, what? Yeah, let's go back to the post-op x-ray, Scott, if we can, because there's yeah. a lot of stuff to teach about here. Yep. So let's assume this is in the operating room or right afterwards. It's probably not. It's probably in the office. But you know, one of the things I look at right away is that radial head seems very big to me. It seems long and maybe a little fat. And so, you know, we now know hopefully how to size our radial heads. We want to have it flush with the level of the coronoid. We want it not to dilate the, the uh, ulnar humeral droid and translate it. So you can see on the x-ray on the left, the AP, the ulna is medial to the facet of the trochlea. So that means that it's pushing it over. That combined with the lateral ulnar collateral lemur repair has caused the whole ulna to translate medially. So that radial head is not only too long, it's too wide. And so, you know, when in doubt, you always wanna perhaps undersize your radial head rather than oversize. And when it's comminuted, it can be tough, but the landmarks we now know from George Athwell and others who have looked at this and shown us you want to get that lateral, you want to see the radial head not be too long so it's flush with the coronoid, and you want to see that it's not causing that sigmoid notch to translate over. And so those are the two things that I look at first and foremost. Second thing that doesn't look like was done, you know, that looks like the coronoid fragment on the left of that ulna humeral joint uh, mm -hmm. on that view. And that looks like a relatively sizable piece. So I'm concerned that that was not dealt with. And so um, that may have contributed to this patient's instability as well. And so, you know, when you look at that, go back one more, Scott, when you look at that lateral x-ray, the original lateral x-ray, you can see that the humerus is gliding into the coronoid defect, and it's doing the same thing postoperatively as well. So I think all these things point to the structures we need to try to address and correct. And the most common mistake that results in this, I think, really is, is not dealing with the radial capitella joint appropriately. Yeah. So first oh. and foremost, we got to do something about that. And then we got to try to see what we can do about the coronoid and stabilize the elbow. All, all the exact, exact points. And the elbow is kind of, kind of funny. Now we have a stiff, unstable elbow. And yeah. so the first step I think all of us do is you got to get down to, to get it back to where it was. So you got to open debridement. I spent probably 40 minutes taking out all the scar tissue in the joint, from the front of the joint, the back of the joint, just completely, you know, so I can reduce the joint. 
at least contract the soft tissues. This is debatable. I ignored the common unit coronoid fragments. I, I haven't been successful when there's two or three fragments that are five weeks old to try and actually get them back together that I just haven't been lucky with that site. And here I tried to avoid a meter approach, but what I had in my back pocket was static external fixation. And I just kind of tacked things back together, no graft. Now, I think that's an advantage you can do. So here's what it looks like. This is probably 45 minutes into the operation. I haven't done anything. <laughs> I took out the radial head uh, implant that was oversized, as Brad says. And the cartilage looks great, thank goodness, because often when you see these cases, the cartilage of the distal humerus starts peeling off and, um, and now you're stuck with the arthritic stiff elbow. So I was very encouraged that the cartilage looked good. And at this point, I started the operation, which is pretty simple. I just put a different size radial head in, put a static external fixator on, and you can see the size of her. That's not muscle in, in her yeah. arm there. That's uh, twice the size of my arm. Uh, <laughs> And when you when you put the static fix on, we all can put a static fixer on in half an hour, probably. Right. Um, then I just check a floor shots to make sure that I have it in excellent position, and then and then uh, and I'm done. So usually at, at five weeks, I, I take it off, but I'm a little chicken to take it off in the clinic. Um, so I just put them asleep for a little while in the OR and uh, don't take the pins out. Uh, and just take the, the fixator bar off, and you can see how stiff she is. Uh, not. Uh, right. I, I tell you, I do a little tweaking in extension, but I'm always afraid I'm going to like dislocate them. I'm just chicken. But I, you know, as Dr. Mori says, I do a little examination under anesthesia and flexion, you know, with, with, with no uh, prejudice uh, looking at that. And then there we are in flexion. So this is five weeks. How stiff is she? She's not very stiff, obviously, right? After just a, a little tweaking. But the most important thing is elbows can fool you. She could be hinging, not articulating. So you want to get a view on, on, the, on the fluoro of it actually proving that it's actually articulating and not hinging. Once I saw that, then I pulled the pins out. And that's seven months. And then here she is at one year. See her flexion and extension. That's after five weeks in a static external fixing. And, uh, that's a tremendous save. Yeah. And I think the key thing is the ex external fixator. And, you know, the, the hinge ones kind of scare us because uh, we don't put them on that often. Even, even elbow people don't put them on that often. Uh, so we just did a multi-center, two, two places, Grand King's Place and, and Mayo, uh, looking at static versus dynamic fixation. And you can read the title of the paper, which is essentially the results. There was no difference. And Marcone also, uh, did the same thing looking at just his patients using a static external fixator and motion was comparable to uh, when he used a, a hinge fixer. So, you know, for about almost 10 years now, 10 years now I've, I haven't used a, a, a hinge fixator and don't spend an hour putting those on and just put the, the, the static on it. And of course there's the internal joint stabilizer, which I have not used. Um, that uh, is also an option. What, what are you, what's your experience, to Emily and, and Brad, on, on fixators about the elbow? Emily, go ahead. So, um, I've moved mostly to static external fixators, too. Um, I think I haven't used uh, the, the, the hinge fixes for about 10 years now. Yeah, my thyroid is happy that I don't use <laughs> fixes anymore, trying to find the perfect circle and put the pin in the right place and then uh, articulate the elbow. Yeah, no, I think you point out, this case points out exactly what we've all learned. The key is getting the elbow concentrically reduced and holding it there long enough for the soft tissues to become healed enough to allow motion. So five, six, seven weeks. And, you know, they just don't get that stiff and they get their motion back with rehab. And you don't, I haven't I had to do a second operation for stiffness on any static X fix that I've used. And so with these cases, it's in the room and it's, I'm never unhappy that I have it there and it's easy to put on. Yep. So. Moving on, so a little bit older lady, um, 75 years old. Um, I, I'm gonna kind of walk you guys through this because it's a little tricky case, not, it, it's not- I'll rough for the challenge. It, it's not straightforward, but as a 75 year old, I meet her three, meet her three years later, but not for her fracture, she comes in for loss of finger extension, um, radial nerve PIN dysfunction, essentially. 
uh, mild dementia, right knee OA after a, a fracture, a tubular, pla a tubular plateau, and a left proximal humerus fracture was also treated non-operatively. And I saw all these extras, so I'm gonna kind of walk, walk you through this, but uh, here she was, this is, this is the fracture, and you can see um, the Lecheron fracture, looks like a radial neck fracture, and also a coronoid fracture. We don't have a CT, but uh, so this is the operation she had. And I think we all agree that, whoa, what about the coronoid? The coronoid was not addressed, right? right. And you might say that the radial head may be oversized. It's, it's, it's hard to say, but I think certainly fixation of the electron looks fine. So this was a, a post, post op. Then a month later, looks like this. Well, now maybe you can see the coronoid fracture because it's now in the breeze and the elbow is starting to sublux. Now, this lady uses a cane in this hand. So you might say, well, that's a bad combination. But obviously it is because of her, her knee injury. Well, two months later, and the thing, they, the thing I found amazing is these x-rays get worse. But someone just kept taking x-rays, but not like, what were they saying? Looks good, looks good. Anyway, this is March and said, hey, it looks great. Why don't you come back uh, in May? Oh, boy. Uh, the coronoid fracture is still there. The rail head's now getting loose. And then says, why don't you come back? <laughs> what? What? No. So it looks like this. Now, at this point, I think all of us are thinking, wait a second. This isn't just, you know, a terrible triad gone bad. There's something else going on here. So what do you say? Well, of course you say, come back another year later. Oh my God. And this is when, I think when they saw the radial head was pointing the wrong direction. I said, that was finally the clue? That's the clue. This is not doing well, ma'am. I think I need to send you to an elbow guy. Oh my God. So this is when I met, met the lady, but I think we're both, we're all thinking Charcot joint at this point. This is just yes. bizarre, uh, right? So. Yeah. Right? So, so we did a workup and uh, that's just, that's a nightmare, obviously. So. I got a picture of her quote unquote non-operative left oh, proximal boy. humerus fracture. <laughs> uh, where's the humeral head? Yeah. And we did the usual cervical uh, looking for syrinx and I always get an MRI of the head and also the neck and we found, I'm not a, I'm not a neurosurgeon, but this was quote unquote benign and they treated it non-operatively, but had an effect on the cerebellum and clearly was causing some Charcot, <laughs> Charcot issues. So. As we know, trying, trying to fix Charco elbows is, is not a, a good thing. So I've never taken out a radial head from a, you know, anterior approach, but we did. Oh, wow. oh my God. And so we just, I took that out and the rest of the hardware, I, I think I got most of the hardware out and left wow. her alone. No further surgery. No, I, I put her in a splint, I think for six weeks and she got a little bit stiff and her PIN uh, didn't come back completely, but most of it came back and she was rel relatively happy. But the moral of the story is you should have your spidey sense up. If, if it looks weird and the fracture just falling apart, think about Charcot and at least trying to kind of uh, look at that non-operative treatment of the humerus and um, do your standard uh, syringal uh, myelia uh, type, type workup for Charcot. Here's another, this is, this is unbelievable. This is a, a patient who had a known uh, syringal myelia and had known Charcot had neurosurgery, but still someone put a total elbow in it and it fell apart within two years and came to see me. And I looked at him and said, you know what? I'm not gonna put that bolt back in because it's gonna fail again. And he was from Wisconsin just an hour away and at least over three or four year period, he never, never came back to, to, to see us because there's no stress now in the implants. So hmm. I, th I think they're probably still, but if I put that bolt back in, then things might, start loosening and getting worse. So the moral of the story is try not to operate on Charcot joints. And particularly if you know it's Charcot, like this was a known Charcot joint and someone still did a total elbow and things will always, always go bad if, if you do that. And if you do a total elbow, you know, they're not the most benign procedure. This, you know, this was not a good day, a good day in the OR for me. Uh, this is a patient that we obviously felt was very infected. So total elbows, when they go bad, they go bad. So um, yeah. be, be smart about the, determining who you do that on. We won't show any more of that. 
uh, moving on. So this is uh, some it's maybe a, a similar case in the 59 year old and uh, 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 Emily actually quite kind of gave the answer about how, how to treat this uh, on that on the er earlier case. Uh, obviously, a combination of the the radial head uh, uh, electron and um, and the coronoid and uh, obviously instability. And you can see the, the, here this coronoid fracture does involve the subline tubercle. So I, I think mm -hmm. we probably need to deal with that. And it's a sizable piece and it's, it's displaced. And uh, um, Emily, your, your, your thoughts on, on approaching this one? So glad you showed this case because I haven't seen one of these in a while now. And this is a fun, fun, awesome case. So this one, you could come through the fracture. You can make a posterior yep. incision. Yep. And you basically open up the elbow from the back and unhinge the fracture and you have an excellent view of the radial head. You have an excellent view of the coronoid. It's awesome. Yep. And, and uh, I learned that technique from, Dave, I think, David Ring uh, so many years ago. And so I thought about that approach and that is exactly the approach I, when I saw it, just as you, you, know, you look at this and that's exactly the approach that you think you're doing because you make a posterior approach hyperflex it, you can, you can visualize the coronoid fracture, put two buried, buried screws uh, so the heads aren't sticking out so you can reduce the electronoid fracture and then replace the radial head. Um, and so that's, that's what I thought I would do. But I actually, I went ahead and uh, took out, did a, a, a lateral approach, took out the radial head um, and had exposure of, of the coronoid and put uh, buried screws that we could then allow us to put a plate on top of those screws um, and so that's, that's what we did. But I think for the fellows, the approach that Emily's talking about, I think is really a great trick that, that as I said, I learned from David Ring where you can book open. It's like the patient gives you a lecture on osteotomy. So you can approach the coronoid and uh, allows you to re reduce it, put uh, buried screws in, and then, and then put the, put the plate on the clothes, close everything down. And that, that technique would work just as well. And you can see the, we can now put the put the plate on, and uh, this patient did uh, did okay. I'm sure the motion was not perfect. I, I remember afterwards, but those are the two approaches to this type of uh, type of fracture. So, uh, moving a little bit more up the arm a little bit. Um, so this is an 89 year old, reasonably healthy, on Coumadin, comes in two weeks after this injury. They, he was actually from Minnesota, but he fell in Washington, D.C., if I remember correctly, and comes in with this and with almost a note pinned to his chest, please put some plates and fix this fracture from the doctor in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, not so fast, cowboy. Um, 89 years old. Um, you guys thoughts on perhaps non-operative treatment? Well, so I would get a CAT scan, Scott because I want to see, it looks like you might have, and you know, the x-ray on the left looks like the articular surface is intact, but the x-ray on the right, I'm concerned. The, the, the medial condyle is off, but I'm, I want to make sure that there's not a transcondylar split, because that's going to maybe change how I manage this. Um, and so, you know, if his, if his joint is intact and it's really a, a supracondylar fracture, then you might be able to get away with non operative treatment. But if it's an intracondylar or you know, intraarticular fracture, I'd be more concerned. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a CT. I don't remember if we did get a CT, but we did get other views. Okay. And it's hard to see on the, on the PowerPoint, but there was not an intracondylar split. So we decided to treat them non-operatively. And here was five, five months, five and a half months. He's got no pain. I remember when I said, we're gonna just put you in a cast for a few weeks. He's like, no, I was told I need an operation, young man. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you can see his range of motion. It's not great. 25 to 130, pronation 80, supination 85. No pain. The guy's happy. And I'm well, thinking, let's be clear. That motion is great. You do a you do an RAF on this guy, and the plates fall off, and he has to be in a cast anyways for six weeks because his bone's so poor. That's a great outcome. <laughs> and, and, and bingo. And and here's a paper from Graham King's group uh, where they looked at you know where he was. I think healthy enough to do an RIF, but uh, still he was on Coumadin and had some heart issues and this guy's almost 90 years old. But here's a Graham King's group, 32 low demand patients. And interesting enough, they included type C, 10 type C fractures. So yeah. kind of like Brad was talking about, intracondylar uh, fractures, not, not, not the best. 
and they did reasonably well. I mean, it's not, they're not perfect, like it's six to eight percent good, the excellent. Right. Two poor results, one converted to a total elbow, and that patient did okay. Union rate, 81%. And this slide I find very depressing, and I do have to share it with you, but this is looking at another study, looking at TEA, ORIF, and non-op treatment. Look at the numbers across the board. Right. About 100 degrees, total arc of motion, 25 to 120, no matter what you do. <laughs> with the total elbow, that patient couldn't come back infected like that terrible slide or video I showed. ROIF and so non-op was something that maybe because it was called bag of bones, I didn't really consider that part of my armamentarium until maybe 10 years ago. And now I, I do use that judiciously uh, in the unhealthy patient and uh, in some of the very elderly patients. And uh, I'm wondering your, your guys' thoughts on on your use of non-operative treatment on, on some of these fractures. And Emily, your thoughts maybe first? Well, I think you stumped me on that case. I was thinking total elbow on him. Um, <laughs> um, but I think, um, you know, a really low demand patient who might consider uh, treating them conservatively. Most of mine, I, I am still uh, someone who would tend to operate on these. Yeah. And at it's 90, fractures, you know, total elbow would probably do pretty well in a 90 year old. So I would agree. I think, I don't think that would be wrong. Um, I think there's just, we can add non operative to something we can consider. I'm not saying to use it a lot. Um, see, Graham King's study just had 30 some patients. So it's not, not commonly used by me either. So I think if you're going to do that, Scott, you've got to monitor the patient closely and you got to s figure out in your mind what's the position that you're going to mobilize them in. Because if you flex them too much, now you flex a fragment and you might run the risk of it displacing or vice versa. So it's also got to be something they can tolerate. So a nine year old might be able to tolerate a cast for six weeks, um, but also they may not. And so that's an important part of the conversation. And if you're going to do that, just like, you know, with other fractures, you're going to want to monitor it and make sure you're not missing that it's completely displaced in the cast. You know, don't do, don't do a cast and get an x-ray at one week and then another one at six weeks you've got to keep an eye on it and make sure it's, it's maintaining its alignment. Yeah, that's such an excellent point because even that other case that I did, that minimum fixation, we, I see these patients back every two weeks until we get to about um, six weeks out and make sure they haven't slipped. That's right. a very good, it, it's almost more work on your part right. back in the clinic more commonly than you would if you did an RF and you got stable fixation. It's a very, that's an excellent point. So this is a weird case. So I'll kind of walk you through, but the fellows should know that you know, it ain't always what it seems to be. So he's a 50 year old, okay, 50 year old, elbow pain, no trauma, but his referring doctor thought he had a loose elbow, but he still had a flexion contracture and pain and thought that he needed a lateral ligament reconstruction. Huh. So here's the uh, exact uh, copy from the operative report. You can see it says preoperative diagnosis, you know, instability, but the guy had no trauma. How does that happen? I don't think that can happen. And the right radial had OCD lesion. And what they did, they did a reconstruction of the palmaris graft of his other arm. Was he a thrower? I don't think so. <laughs> and microfracture of his radial had OCD lesion. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I rarely see OCD in a 50 year old. And in the radial head, I don't think right. I've ever seen it. So. Was it iatrogenic? Well, <laughs> you know, still painful after the surgery. And then. One year later, still hurting, refer for a second opinion. Pain's never gone away. Still has his flexion contracture. He does have a slight supination rollout. I, I can, but I'm wondering, is that from his surgery? Did they, right. <laughs> did that make him worse? And he still has pain present in his elbow. Pain's present all the time. I had the benefit of seeing him one year later. I thought, I don't know if my pointer comes out, but I thought this looked a little, a little weird up here. Maybe that's his OCD lesion over here. So. I got a CT scan. They didn't get a CT scan, but I think we can see here, mm. that's, that's not an OCD lesion, that's an osteoidosioma probably. Right. So we, you know, it looked accessible arthroscopically, so it looks terrible. Wow. But then, so we, we, took the, uh, we took that out arthroscopically, but the, the scariest part for me was wondering what happens if you, if you find the nidus, 
you grab the nidus and then you drop it arthroscopically and you can't find that. It floats away. It floats away. I wonder what would happen, but that's it. That's the nidus. That's coming out. So we got rid of that. And um, he had a defect in his radial head after that, but it, you don't see it for a second, I guess, but I didn't, I didn't deal with that, that defect at all. There it is. It still has articular service. I didn't do anything, but it comes back in two weeks. Since the pain was gone the next day, I've been pain free for a couple of years. So a lot of these patients, I never saw them again. You know, the guy just took off. So, right. you know, we should, glomus tumors can also occur, occur superficially in the subcutaneous tissues around the elbow. Uh, Jim Dobbins ta taught me that. And osteoblastomas can also occur. I remember that the day I saw him in the clinic, I saw another patient with osteoblastoma in the medial epicondyle. And when the second guy asked me how common is this, I said, well, I just saw a guy had the same thing. So it's obviously not, not, not very common, but so as fellows, you know, have your spidey sense up if something doesn't seem right. Patient, if a patient has not had any trauma and they have a flexion contracture, start thinking what's going on here. They shouldn't have a flexion contracture. So anyway, that's just a case I, th I threw in there. So we may be finishing on this case or maybe we'll, we'll see. So this is, I've showed this case before at one of the webinars, but I think it's, for me, it's sort of a public service announcement that, that there's an injury that I think can be missed, um, but does occur. It's not common, but it, I learned about this from my, my partner, Sean O'Driscoll, when he had a very similar case. So he taught me to look for this injury. And so I've been trying to teach others uh, out there. So it's a 16 year old, uh, had a hyperextension injury, similar, it's almost similar to that weightlifter I showed her earlier on. This is his injury film. And you can see the, the radial heads, something's not right with the radial head. It's, it's anterior and medial. And something's obviously wrong here because we now can see a concentric reduction of the ulnar humeral joint. And this is him in the scanner. He's obviously very loose. I mean, it's, he's loosey goosey, just like that weightlifter. He's got a, a teeny tiny coronoid uh, avulsion there, but otherwise it's very unstable. But what's going on with that? Right. So one thing that Sean Driscoll also taught me is get x rays to the opposite side. Maybe he was born that way. Maybe he's weird. Maybe he's, radial, he's got some kind of congenital radial head subluxation. And it truly really is just an elbow dislocation with something that he's had since early on in life. But his opposite side was totally normal. So MRI was just a mess. Um, but nothing was mentioned about the structure you can see with the arrow on the on the left by the by the radiologist, but you can see on, on the on the on the different sections that there's a a structure ligament a structure going around the neck of the radius around the neck of the radius. So knowing what Sean taught me um, that this could be related to the um, brachialis tendon. So. First, we did a medial approach, two incisions, as, as Emily and Brad said, uh, I've gotten away from just a poster, in, you know, a big poster incision, repaired what I could of the brachialis and the, and the MCL, kind of tacked things back together. And the fun part was doing a, a lateral approach to see if indeed what Sean taught me would be there. And uh, sure enough, it was. So this is a brachialis dislocation. And for all the world, wow. it looks like a, like a biceps tendon. It's on a loop, so you'll see it run back and forth. But look at that. That, looks, that to me looks like, like a biceps tendon. Yeah. And, but the key is if you put your finger in and put your finger on that structure, it goes to the ulna. So all we did was flip that back. You can see it's got a bald uh, lateral epicondyle. Repaired that with the um, um, heavy suture technique that we showed. And, and here's the thing is that the, the superficial head of the brachialis is, is a tendon. And I, you know, I, I, in some cases I've, I've been in another room and the fellow says the, the biceps tendon ductum is not ruptured, it's intact. And they're looking at the superficial head of the, of the brachialis in most cases. And this indeed, this is the, the fleshy part of the brachialis, but the superficial head can get wrapped around the neck of the radius. And uh, so he was, he was reduced after he did that and he, he mm. did, did fine. And uh, we actually wrote it up as a case report. Um, but you can see the incision we did laterally, and then you can see its incision um, medially uh, where we tack things back together. And trauma is not random, so six months later he broke his clavicle, and I got to fix that also. <laughs> I hope he's still alive. But uh, anyway, just 
keep in mind, it's not, not always the, the biceps. And I think most of the time it's probably not the biceps that gets wrapped around the neck and the radius, but uh, part of the, the brachialis. And time-wise here, let me just see what this last, um, we can maybe go through one more case. We got, we can speed through this one and then call it a night. Does that sound fair? Sure. Are there any questions from the fellows? Uh, not so far. Nothing came through the chat. Don't be shy, guys. Come on, you, got, you, you got people who want to want to talk and answer stuff. Yeah, last last case, 64-year-old. Again, big forearm, uh, falls from a standing height, not off her motorcycle. Mm. Uh, and we can see, you can tell she's, if you look on the, on the right, she is similar to one of the other cases. She has di sublocks dislocated. And then she's reduced, as you can see. Uh, as you can see here. And let's see, do we have a CT scan? Yep, we have a CT scan. And I'll point out that the, the sublime tubercle is totally intact. This is a almost entirely laterally based coronoid fracture. So I think all of us are not really terribly concerned about the coronoid stability. We have the, the bony stability medial is enough. I think we all agree, but the radial head's a mess. Yep. So uh, Emily, your thoughts on how you might uh, approach this lady? Yeah, so I would approach this through a, a lateral incision. Um, I would replace that radial head. Um, I would repair the lateral ligament complex. And, you know, for that uh, tip type coronoid fracture, you know, they're a little controversial. Um, I, I know that, you know, the fragments are actually a little bit larger, probably two millimeters larger than you actually, you visualize on that 3D CT scan because of the, the cartilage cap. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't go after it. You know, I, you know, if anything, I would put a suture through it so we could view it when we're resected the radial head, you can put two osseous, uh, transosseous drill holes and pass a suture through that. I, I don't think you need it, but I probably would do it while I'm there. And, and that's exactly the, exactly the thoughts, thoughts that we had. So we actually went in and, um, it was unstable medial early, did the floor EUA. The, the piece was, they were actually, I thought was un, unfixable. You could do the, the caps, capture technique, but I thought, well, I actually resected the fragments. I didn't want them floating around the joint. Um, did exactly what you said about the lateral side and replaced the radial head. So I guess I didn't do the right thing. Look, two weeks post-op, oops, you know, patient comes back. And I remember the fellow actually uh, saw the patient and had already told them we got time in the OR tomorrow, uh, oh. add you on. And I was like, you told him that? I said, yeah, we got we to go back in. We got to do something on the medial side probably. And, and you know, there's something back again on the, on the lateral side. I said, well, there's a paper out there from David Ring and Mike McKee. And so we didn't, we um, put her in overhead exercises. And I think the key, the key learning point for the fellows, if you have bony stability medially, which we definitely had, and we have metallic bony stability, so to speak, laterally. This is really like a simple elbow dislocation. And you wouldn't necessarily operate on a simple elbow dislocation. You restored all the bony stability with metal and, well, bone on the medial side. So um, this is what she looked like four weeks later, just overhead exercises. And a, this lady was from Michigan, and she's a, a very nice lady, and she did did great, great range of motion. And again, it wasn't my idea, but it's this paper um, by Duckworth uh, that Mike McKean, David Ring were involved in of slight residual subluxation on operative and non-operative tr treatment called the drop sign. And you don't necessarily need to rush back in. So what I would say is if you have, if there was a significant coronoid fracture that I, I don't know, for some reason didn't fix, you need to go back in when you see that because it's just going to get worse. But if your bony stability has been restored with metal or real bone, you know, try try doing what this paper suggests. And I suggest all, all you guys take a look at this paper uh, that they published that uh, that I learned a lot a lot from. Uh, your, your guys' thoughts on this? Uh, we have one final question that from from the panelists, and it's a I think it's a good question to end it on. Is that everyone on the panels their opinion about the role of IJS and what role should it have in uh, traumatic instability? Since none of your cases tonight used uh, that device and wanted to hear uh, everyone's thoughts about that. I think that's a great question. I have not used that device. I, I, I think uh, Brad's institution has used it probably more than a lot. So maybe Brad, maybe you want to uh, 
uh, yeah. give you calls first and then Emily. I, I haven't used it, but my partners have. And, and I would tell you that they're using it in cases where if there's bipolar disease, so both the medial and lateral side is out and you're concerned that your repair is tenuous, or if you're concerned that the patient's got a heavy arm, like Scott has shown, you're going to use it as an adjunct to your fixation. And just like I feel like I've gone to putting a static X, X fix on whenever I'm nervous about the patient, I think this is an alternative that you can do that in the, in the same way. Uh, and obviously it's less morbid to the patient that it's not sticking out their skin. Um, so I don't have any personal experience, but I think it has made it easier to handle some of these complex trauma situations. Emily, your thoughts? Yeah, I've only used it once. Um, you know, it's not readily available, as you know, as, as well as I am having an X fix set around. So um, I've used it in one where I did an interpositional arthroplasty and, and um, maybe another time, but not in the acute setting of trauma. I, I just put a large X fix on. So I'm gonna make a comment. I've taken five out in the last six months. Wow. And, I, and, I, and I, I think, unfortunately, uh, you have to be very mindful in following what Dr. Parsons said. It's an adjunct. I don't think you. I don't think people should use it as a primary method of fixation or as one. Uh, uh, and you have to be very careful about that. Hey Scott, can we make one more point? Can you go back to your X-ray because your X-ray just is a very helpful. The one before, yeah. So. I want the fellows to understand what a drop sign is. This is, this is what the drop sign or a, a, I call it a sag sign, same thing. The difference between this and the coronoid that's unstable and causing instability is that the humerus is not going anterior to the tip of the coronoid. So here the humerus and the greater sigmoid notch are perfectly aligned in the vertical axis. When the humerus goes anterior into the coronoid bed, that is a different problem. And that's one where the elbow is unstable in rotation or in you know axial loading distally and so you have to be able to differentiate those two because if you take the patient who's rotationally unstable or the humerus is riding into the coronary bed and do your flexion exercise you know your your flexion exercise it's not going to work well this will is a different animal that's an excellent excellent point and and if you have that coronary fracture you can't you can't just do a non-op over, overhead exercise well i guess we're out of time ron john i guess you want to take us home uh, Joaquin, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. You can you can close the session. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for your time tonight. We very much appreciate your your comments, your your questions. We are continuing with our series um, as a as a as a teaser. Um, in the next month, we are going to be having a six sessions on transitioning from fellowship to uh, your job with practical aspects about uh, jobs as well as contracts and whatnot. So we're gonna be th this, th we're gonna go from this introductory to jobs and then back again later on in the year with other cases. So thank you everybody. Look forward to seeing you soon. Great job, Scott. Thank you guys. Thanks guys. Thanks guys.